All right, we're live. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mario Cavallo. Welcome to a brand new show, The War on China with Fernando Munoz <laughs> and myself, Mario Cavallo. I want you to know that we are both very, very excited uh, about this new idea, this new concept. I spoke recently with Fernando. I came to him with the idea, with the inspiration and the spirit of a show from the 1980s in the United States, a political talk show by the name of John McLaughlin Group. Now, mm -hmm. some of you who are, I'm revealing my age by this, some of you know who John McLaughlin is. And the point is this, Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the situation with respect to China, China's rise and the battle that is on, it is a war. The stakes are high and it is not good enough to be able to just sit back, relax and have rational, explanatory, factual conversations. And all those conversations are being had. We need to take it up a level. We need to take it to a deeper place, a more passionate and a more argumentative place. Fernando and I trust and respect each other tremendously since we met. We have a different set of talents and abilities, but I will tell you this, okay? We are the experts. We are angry. Mm. And my part in this show is to present you with what I know is evidently, observably, reasonable truth. Fernando. Well, uh, we have to start by saying very, very clearly why we are the experts. You, Mario, for example, you have been in this country for 21 years. You have a lovely wife. You have your family. You have your mother-in-law who doesn't speak a word of English, right? Right. And you've right. written three books on China. Some of them have been published in Hong Kong and internationally. You're also a senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. You, you, you are a person who has a lot of knowledge about China. You're a national media commentator. You're all the time on media. You're all the time on TV. And they take your word and your arguments as solid because they're based on knowledge. And yes, you're an angry Italian. You have Latino blood like me. We both share that. So that's why, that's why you're here. That's why you, the viewers, are also here. So, uh, look, enough said. When it comes to China, we want to undo the brainwashing that you have received. And I want to show you how tremendously fantastic China really is. So, right. uh, without further ado, let's get on to the topic. The three Bs, Mr. Mario. What are the three Bs? The three Bs. The three Bs for today. <laughs> Lincoln, Brussels, and I'll <laughs> Yeah, we're 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 keeping the show. This is going to be a clean show. Uh, we're not <laughs> Lincoln's Brussels baloney, ladies and gentlemen. Look at me. Listen to me. I'm not pulling any punches. I appreciate what Fernando just said. I'm in China 21 years. I got a Chinese wife. I got a mother-in-law who doesn't speak a wink of English. You know what? She's my best teacher. You want to know what's going on here in China? I wrote three books on China. I'm a senior fellow with the Center for China and Globalization. Listen to me. You think I'm playing games when I'm sitting here to talk to you about China? My life is in China. I'm an independent entrepreneur here in China. It's not about me. It's not about Fernando. It's not even about any of us. You know who it's about? It's about my 10-year-old boy. That's who it's about. I'm worried Correct. about him. And we got Fernando, we got Blinken, the Department of State, the State Department of the United States of America comes out yesterday and I need everybody to understand the real game here. The game here is not about truth and facts. The game here is about strategy and provocation. Fernando, listen to me. Look at me. Everybody yeah. understand what I'm talking about. Who else has been here in China for 20 years? That guy right over there, Fernando. He's a distinguished 
He's a distinguished citizen of Dongguan. He's a business entrepreneur. He's been acting as a bridge between foreigners in China, including consulting for the government down there to help them out for 20 years. Between the two of us, that's four decades. You think we're playing games here? You think you want to play? Oh, he dare a couple of woomows. Listen to me. Screw you. We're not listening to you. We, you don't respect us. We're not listening to you. You don't talk that way. You don't think that way. You want to be anti-China? It means you're brainwashed already. It means the effective, amazing, remarkable. They are the experts, the Western propaganda media, corporations, PR firms. I know because I teach this stuff to the executives, how to be yeah. manipulative how to be deceptive, how to use the language to confuse and brainwash people. So if you're sitting there saying to yourself, these guys are full of crap, you're already brainwashed and you don't even know it. And like Fernando said, we're trying to help you undo the brainwashing. Now, listen to me. How do we undo the brainwashing? How do I say to you what I know is what I know? Because, you know, Fernando and I this morning, we dis you and I discussed this. Here's the problem. Mm. Guys like you and me, we don't have a lot of friends. You know why we don't have a lot of friends? <laughs> because we're right. When we know we're right, we say we're right. My mother's always complained to me about this, and so does my wife. But listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. If I say something to you about China, it's true. It's real. It's solid as a rock. It's crystal clear. You can take it to the bank. Do you think I would put myself out on the global stage? I wrote an article that got 2 million hits, 2 million views in LinkedIn. It's the number one top China article ever written. After it got translated, half a billion people in China love me because I wrote it. Do you think I'm writing crap? Do you think I'm going to put my public reputation on the line and I'm going to say something to you publicly here on YouTube that isn't true? Listen to me about China. If I've ever said something to you that Fernando then backs up because he's got his own equal type of experience here between the two of us for decades. Come on. You think we're playing games here? If I say something to you, it's based on the root of my work. My character as a person, a guy with a Chinese wife, and the root is there. <laughs> and, <laughs> Mario, let me tell you what we're going to do today. We're going to go, we're going to go uh, sentence by sentence with some of the things that Blinken said, and I'm going to tell you yeah. how I see the things and how you see the things. The first thing that he said is that there is more than one million Uyghurs in Xinjiang imprisoned, and they're running a hundred, sorry, a thousand two hundred. Uh, state-run uh, imprison, imprisonment facilities. My first thought, and I put it out to you, you tell me, what do you think? What about American prisons? What about American prisons? Are those state-run or are those private-run? Because that's the thing, they're private runs. And the ones that are private run, they're using the prisoners to basically make things and sell them to other countries. Like, for example, weapons, helmets, uh, Lockheed Martin. Because that's one of the things that he was saying, that they're using uh, prisoners and their labor to actually, well, make things to sell to, to other countries. First of all, you don't get to call China something that you're already doing. That's the first thing that I have to say. Now, it's the protection. second thing is evidence. Where is the evidence of this million Uyghur coming from? It's all from the media. It's all from the World Uyghur Congress. It's all from somebody who came up with that number. Have you have you heard about CJ Wersleman? He started with oh. one million, he went to three million, he went to six million, and he said nine million. This is documented stuff that he's got on Twitter. There's pictures, there's evidence, there's... How? How do they get to 75% of Uyghurs being imprisoned? A person with a blue tick. How? Where does that come from? You tell me, Mario. Max Blumenthal, God bless him. He supported my work. I did my we, my Xinjiang video back in September 2020 for CGTN. I already debunked all this stuff 18 months ago. Max Blumenthal, in that video, I borrowed his, I, I borrowed his clip. He's also been interviewed on CGTN. He had a conversation with the head of the World Uyghur Congress, Omar Kadat, and he asked him, well, where'd you get this number from? 
And Omar Kadat, the head of the World Uyghur Congress, the said media. from the, the media. media. Give me a break. Now, look, listen to me. On this prison thing, on this prison thing, you're on the right track. Fernando, you're on the right track. But now I want to add to it. Because the key point here is the words, as you said, line by line, the words Blinken used. What is evidently observably true about what he said? And in uh, the ancient Greek, I looked this up today, it's called apodictic, apodictic wording, which means it's certainly evidently demonstrably true. And that's the basis for what I say. If I've said mm -hmm. something, because it's evidently demonstrably observably true. So what did Blinken say? He didn't say that. He no. said, he Some said. That is problematic, problematic, which is the opposite. It's intent, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm here today, I wanna to teach you deceptive, like, intentional deceptive manipulative language skills. This is what they do on purpose. The word problematic, what does it mean? Think about it for a second. It's intentionally negative, but it's also intentionally non-conclusive and vague. It doesn't come to any kind of a final conclusion because mm -hmm. it's put out as an assertoric, rhetorical statement. Table. Amen. It's assertorical. Ancient Greek, assert. I'm asserting something, but I'm just putting it out there in the air for everyone to feel it. It doesn't have any evidence. It's problematic. It's not apodictic. When something is apodictic, it is evidently demonstrably true. Now, what did I have Blinken to jump in. I have to jump in. I wish yeah. Adrian Sands would learn that word. Adrian Sands is nothing but a science fiction writer. Now, you were going to say something though before we go there. Let's go to the second thing that uh, Blinken said, right? He was talking about the inmates that were subject to violence, torture, and all the other forms that we're going to mention here, basically rape, right? Um, to get people to work and make things for, for China and to sell to other words. That's the whole idea of forced labor. The point is, even his previous, his predecessor, right? What's his name? Mike. I'm bad. Mike, plenty Mike of Pompeo. evidence. Where is the evidence? Where is the evidence? In the tribunal? In the Uyghur tribunal? That farce? Where he is repeated. the evidence? He said, just, oh, we can talk, the and talk we without evidence. evidence. They never showed the evidence. They never showed the evidence. I have to go back. I have to go back because I didn't finish answering sure. a point. What Blinken said, intentionally used deceptively vague language. He said, the Uyghurs are in, and he said something that he knows to be untrue. He said, and that those Uyghurs are being held in 1,200 internment camps all over the country, all over Xinjiang. Listen to me very carefully. I want to ask everybody listening, what is an internment camp? What the hell is an internment camp? Mm -hmm. what, what is that word? Inter well, I know one thing. It must be bad. You see, mm. that's what they want you to feel and think. It's bad. It's an internment camp. Okay, I can picture Robin Williams doing a stand-up about this. God bless that guy. Okay, it's an internment camp. You know, listen to me. In every country of the world, not just China, in the United States, as Fernando just mentioned, in Germany, in Italy, in France, in 150, 250 countries all over the world, are there prisons? Yes. And the maximum security are, prisons. Are there prisons all over the world? Yes. Including Xinjiang? Yes. Are there schools? Schools, like school, elementary school, middle school, high school, besides college. Are there schools, elementary, middle, and high school? Are there schools in every country in the world? Yes. Of course. Do you know that every child in the world is coerced and forced to go to school? Do you know legally you have to go to school? <gasps> oh, this is hard. So, so of, of course your kid has to go to school. It's illegal to not send your kid to school. And if you don't, you have to enroll them in an official homeschool program. So children are forced to go to school all over the world. You see how they play games with you? So. Are prisoners forced to be in prison? Oh, hell yeah, they're 
criminals. Yeah, they're in prison. Now, the other thing that they play with, the other thing that they play with Mario is the idea of vocational training training thank centers. You. Thank you. Let's get word that. Vocational. It means you want to go or you don't want to go. You want to get the training or you don't want to get the training. You want to get the, the skills and, and, and the knowledge that you need to improve your life and get a better job and, and prosper in life or you don't. Is that simple? Sure, that's what they call vocational training centers. But to them, oh, that's that's not the right thing to do. That's it's a priest. They're forcing them. It's in the word. Fernando, vocational training center advertisements in Phoenix, Arizona. For 20 years, I was living there. But God bless my mother, my brother, my daughter. They're still there. Mwah! I love you in Phoenix, Arizona. DeVry Institute, vocational and technical training center. Sign up. This, to get your skills, to get a job, to improve your life. It's exactly what the Chinese are doing. So now let me ask you a question in Xinjiang. Are there prisons? Yes. Are there schools? Yes. And are the people at the prisons and the schools forced to be there? Yes. And are there vocational training centers? Yes. And are those people forced to be there? No. And there are internment camps. The hell is an internment camp? They, they it's not exactly what they're doing. You're talking about language. And I also talked about language before. They use the word camp because they know that that has a connotation. That takes person's brain to think about Germany, about the well, the Nazi camps. Oh, and well, we're going to talk about the G word later. But let's finish with this idea right here: the idea about the torture, the rape, and and um, and the violence. Where's the evidence? Where's the proof? The one that you see is this lady, Tur uh, Tursene, who has changed her story three times already. Three times already. First, she said, oh, it was only kind of like psychological pressure and, and they just tell you to do things. Um, ah, move on. She's so unimportant. Let's move on from her. her she, she's right. ridiculous. She, she's Next zero thing. credibility there. Move on. Go. Next thing that, that, that Blinken said. Let's go to number three, guys. Here's the silliest thing I've ever heard him say. He just generalized forced labor to all of China. He just Incredible. said all citizens, not only in Xinjiang, are being coerced to work uh, against their will. How can you spout something like that from a pulpit like the, the, the Secretary of State? How can we you knew do that when you go to Brussels and talk to the world? We knew this was coming, number one. Number two, real quick, let me apologize to all the audience. I've been looking at the wrong damn corner of my camera. I thought my lens was over here. My lens was over here. I'm straightening it out. Listen to me. This is where you're here. <laughs> I love you. Fer Fernando, we, we knew this was coming, didn't we? Okay, mm -hmm. because this higher this what they say is not about the facts, it's not about the truth, it's the execution of their strategy to mm -hmm. stop China. This is strategic economic terrorism. Continue. I love that. That you coined that a few days ago in another show, and, and everybody's been saying that is exactly what it is. That's economic terrorism. And that's something that we got to coin and, and, and use more often because that's exactly what it is. Because think about this. What is he trying to do now? He's just trying to blanket the whole country on the idea of forced labor. They're coerced to work. And, and, and now every single product from China is going to be tainted. This is the first time that I heard him say this. Let's just, just very casually mention it. How, where's the sense of responsibility and decency? How can you accuse a whole country and all its citizens of using forced labor? Jack I, I, it's beyond, Jack, beyond believable. Jack Ma's, this is a game. Jack Ma's Alibaba, Jack Ma's Alibaba is Joe Joliu. 996, okay? If that isn't forced labor and slavery of employees, I don't know what is. Now, now what I just said is, the re what I just said is, is a ridiculous idea. And it's a ridiculous idea, okay? I did a leadership seminar series for G GE, General mm -hmm. Electric, here in uh, China, the na national level back in early 2000s. 
And I sat in these leadership programs for five days. Okay. It was clear as a bell back then that if you were working for corporate GE, like you were working for most every Fortune 500 company back then, just like whether it's uh, American or any other company, you, they owned your ass. They owned your butt. You worked day and night. You didn't see your kids. You didn't see your wife. And you were lucky if your marriage survived it. Okay. It was Jojo Liu, 996 hours with GE here in China, just like it is to this day back in America when you are corporate with these companies and you're making big money. This is the way it is. This is the way it was when I was doing work for Geely in Hangzhou. Geely, the, the second biggest automotive company in China, you know, behind yeah. Great Wall. Okay. This is the way it is. Okay. So the idea that they're extending this out now to China in general is once again, it is strategy. It has nothing to do, ladies and gentlemen, with reality. We live here in China. We interact with Chinese international companies like Geely. I just mentioned several companies that are here in China all the time. The employees work. Uh, they don't go home at five o'clock. You know, we're talking about white collar, mid-level management type people, right? They don't go home at five o'clock. Nobody goes home at five o'clock in 2021. <laughs> Are you kidding me? They, they get home at 7, 7.30. This is life. You, know you, <laughs> what, no. you, want, you want to get ahead in your life? You, got, you want to get ahead in your life in the United States? Do you leave the office at 5 o'clock? I don't think so. Give me a break. I have, to in. I have to jump in, Mario. There's another aspect of this that they call the mobilization of labor. It's like, oh, they're forcing people to go from one province to the next. And here's my point to most people. China has been a communist country since forever. We just celebrated 100 years of the CPC, right? And Western companies, Western manufacturers never had an issue with China being a communist country. Since the reform in Open and Open, they opened up in 1979, they started flocking here, coming here, investing here, getting more profits, destroying the middle class of America in order to get more profits and satisfy the stock market. That's what they've been doing for the last 40 years. And had they ever had any issue with workers coming from one place to another. What did China do? How did China develop? They developed first the coastal areas and the eastern part of China. So all the coast and all the south, Guangdong, where I live, where I've been for 20 years and I've seen all the developments and all these particular things that I'm mentioning, I've seen it with my own eyes and I've experienced it. That's what they did. Where do you think they got all the talent? This city was, what, 100,000, 200,000 people? Now it's about 10 million people. Where do you think those people came from? And how long have they been coming here? For about 20, 30, 40 years, they've been moving here to get better jobs and use their talent to prosper in life. But now, because it's Xinjiang and people are going to Xinjiang or people from Xinjiang is being invited to go to other places to work, oh, now that's a problem. Now that's a problem. Hey. Everybody knows this is a fake argument in the United States of America, the best, the wonderful country. Listen to me. The United States post-World War, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. This was the beautiful they America. All. They had um, it all. My father, my father had four jobs to get ahead. My father's mm. brother, his uncle, moved to Phoenix, Arizona uh, to, to open a new business. They moved. They were mobile. They moved around to pursue jobs, to put food on the damn table. This is not new, unique to China. This is a false, fake. It's another false, fake deceptive argument. It's meaningless. The same thing goes on in countries all over the world, including the United States. My wife, I met her in Shanghai. Why was she in Shanghai? She left her mother in Shenyang in tears to get a better job in Shanghai. My mother and father left my grandmother in Yonkers, New York to get a better job. My grandmother was pissed off. This is normal. This is life, ladies and gentlemen. It's no okay. different in America than it is in China. Continue. Moving on, moving on to the next uh, point. And this is where we are going to go deep into the explanation of economic terrorism. 
The United States issued last year the Xinjiang Supply Chain Business Advisory. What is this about? It is a document that warns companies in the United States of the economic, legal, and reputational dangers of doing work and doing business with companies in Xinjiang. So we just said that he took this whole forced labor in Xinjiang narrative and expanded it to the whole China. How long do you think it's going to take them to come up with China supply chain business advisory, not just Xinjiang? And what does that do? It starts creating panic in the companies and people start saying like, ooh, what should we do? And, and, and people start making decisions. But here's a very interesting thing that we talked about in the, last, in the last video that we made with Jerry Gray. Why hasn't they sanctioned John Deere? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? That is a direct connection yeah. between cotton yeah. production of Xinjiang and John Deere. It's one of the largest customers so, in the world for John Deere. Why hasn't John Deere been sanctioned? Why hasn't he faced legal co uh, consequences? No, he, it, the company. Why hasn't it faced legal consequences? Why hasn't it faced economic or reputational consequences? Well, we're hoping that this gives us some reputational consequence to John Deere. Let's see if we can make that happen. Until you, Larry. you know who's crying. You know who's crying, and they should be. They're cringing every time the State Department, the government, goes on TV with this crap, with these announcements. Think about it for a second. The American Chamber. I'm a member of the American Chamber of Commerce here in China. Uh -huh. Chapter Shanghai, Beijing. These are companies that have invested billions of dollars, have Americans working for their companies, many of them with Chinese families, some of them with American families that are here as expats on contracts. These are American companies who are, as you know, contrary. Here's another lie. Contrary to what everyone, what they're trying to say, companies are pulling out of China. They're increasing their investments in China. You know Gentlemen, why? this is why you watch this show. This is why you got to watch what Mario has to say. He's got all the inside information. Tell us more. They are increasing their investments in China. The survey of the American Chamber of Commerce and the survey of the uh, United the, Bus the Business Council. The exact name is, is, is escaping me of the Business Council. Ladies and gentlemen, they are surveying them. Not only are they not leaving 71 percent of American and even European companies who are here in China now, now, not survey from two years ago, now, recent, the most recent information, not only are they not leaving, 71% of those companies are increasing their investments and commitments to in the Chinese marketplace and in the global marketplace via China. Okay, that's Look. the reality of what's happening economically. So who is secretary of Blinken's Brussels baloney herding more than anybody else? American companies that are here in China. I have to tell you, this is just lip service from Blinken. This is just lip service, because think about that. There was a report from CGTN and China that exports, business going outside from Xinjiang has actually grown, has actually grown. How, how is that possible? Now, here's another thing. You want to ask H&M how their second quarter was? More than 25% down in business. So, Blinken, stop the talking. Stop just baloney. It's all you're saying. Because business is increasing in exports from Xinjiang, and Western companies are suffering because the reputation has been tarnished by you. By you. What? What could possibly be the purpose of this strategy? We got to ask ourselves this question. What could possibly be the purpose? Listen to me. The other subject that we related, I said this to you before, this was Pompeo, okay? The State Department coming out and making these blatant, they're not just making blatantly false statements. They're making blatantly false statements, which are extreme. It's like you accusing me of being a baby killer. It's like, mm -hmm. and then you expect me to sit down at the table and drink tea with you and, ha and negotiate with you and say, let's talk it through after you've accused me of being a baby killer publicly? Are you out of your freaking mind? This is what they're doing. So now we have to stop and think about why. Why mm -hmm. are they doing this? 
Do they understand that they're knowingly destroying and making it extremely difficult for American Chamber of Commerce companies who are doing business here in China? Think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. Why would they do that? How could they be undermining their own American companies that are here in China? What's the, what's what's going on here? Keep going. Well, the there. main thing they want to do is to create unemployment in the region. This is no. This is a strategy. This is the plot. This is a video that I did. This is what I've talked so so many times. They just want to create unemployment because we they know that unemployment. This is a very old strategy. Unemployment creates a recipe, creates the 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 the, the right temperature and the right conditions for people to revolt, for people to create unrest, for people to blame. Oh, and, and complain about oh. the government. That's what they want to do. That's exactly what they do. It's all the sanctions. On the, think about Venezuela. Think about um, all the sanctions on Iran. Think so, all the sanctions on Syria. What are they trying to do? They're trying to squeeze the governments. They're trying to squeeze the population, make them suffer, make them pay so that they will break and then they'll come in and share the split. Thank you. And that is what they're doing in Xinjiang. And that's what Tiananmen's, and I'm going to go back to the Korean, I'm going to go back 70 dec, uh, uh, seven decades. Listen to me. That's what they did on the Korean Peninsula. Mm. That's what they did. That's what they did in Vietnam. That's what they did with Tiananmen. They tried, people don't realize they tried to, they tried to undermine and take over China. That's what Tiananmen Square was all about. It was the same thing. Okay. Yeah. They would they 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 put a small very clearly they put a small group of violent students amongst the you know million of peaceful students who were saying hey we you know we've got some grievances who they were all peaceful they put these violent students in to provoke but what so what were they doing we know what they did they call it color revolution though I don't quite understand the meaning of that phrase but that's okay they put these people in there to provoke intentionally provoke unrest with the belief that the Chinese would do an extreme crackdown to make themselves look bad and then say, exactly. see, look how bad China is. Exactly. And then the ambassador I have to jump so, in. This is the exact scenario that we saw in Hong Kong. And I was asking myself, my God, this has been going on for 18 months. This terrorism, people attacking people, killing people, destroying the city. And I'm biting my, my nails like, when is the PLA going to go in? When is Beijing going to do something? My God, the amount of restraint that they showed unbelievable but here's one thing and i want to connect this to what we just heard xi jinping say that's, um, on the first. Right there. that's you that's saying what it is. To me. listen to me listen to me xi jinping said we will not be bullied we will not be uh threatened no. oh what does oh, blinken oh. do what does blinken do Worse. he goes and wrestle the feathers he goes and just threatens and, and, and bullies China. What are they going to do next? What are they going to do? They're going to escalate into military? I don't think so. But here's the thing. Xi Jinping is putting himself in a very complicated situation because he just said to uh, 1.4 billion people, we will not be bullied. What do we hear now? Blinken saying, oh, bullying China. What's going to be the response? This is what I'm worried about. This is what scares me. You should be worried. You should be scared. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. We're share we're at we're out of time. We're sharing this information with you to each and every one of you. You should be worried. You should be concerned. You should be scared for every reason. We're hitting exactly the nail on the head of what's going on here. Okay? They can't compete. Therefore, they can't do nothing. They can't start a war because they're going to be roundly condemned by the entire international community if they really try to pull another Vietnam they can't, or, or another Korea. They can't do that, okay? Which means they only have one option left, and that is to intentionally provoke. And I'm going to close by saying this to you. Fox News today said President Xi Jinping headline issues veiled threat to the United States. No, Fox News. It wasn't a veiled threat. It was a direct threat. You cannot screw with us, and we're not going to allow you to screw with us. There was nothing veiled about it. It was direct. Fernando, we're out of time. We're going to do our next show. We're going to keep this to 30 minutes. I'm leaving you.
Take care. Bye. We're out.